Hello everyone, I am Nathan Butler. This is my vlog, The Voice of Reason, or Lack Thereof, and this episode is essentially a culminating experience for having attended Celebration Orlando 2017, or Star Wars Celebration 2017 in Orlando, however you want to phrase it. Uh, sitting here with the shirt to prove it. Um, now, I want to cover this in a couple of episodes. I did some updates each night as we were down there with just immediate thoughts on things, on that day's experiences. What I would like to do, because I know that we're going to be discussing certain things like the announcements from it, what new books are coming, and that sort of thing on Star Wars Beyond the Films. We'll be talking a lot about shared and, and comparison of experiences between me and Michael Morris on Cloud City Casino, both of which, by the way, are podcasts you can find on StarWarsReport.com. Um, because that's where that's being handled, I really want to try to focus in this episode and the next episode of the vlog on two different approaches to looking back at Celebration Orlando. This first episode I want to make basically about the logistics of it. Um, how did it work? How did you get into panels? Uh, where did the logistics on behalf of those actually running the convention completely fall apart um, into what you might call cluster boinks? Cluster... I'm going to try not to swear in this episode. Um, we'll see. Uh, but the messes that essentially were of the making of the people who were actually running the thing. But then also some of the lessons learned, some of the things that uh, I wish we could have done better, and some of the ways in which we planned things out that maybe if we had planned things differently, we could have made the experience a little more affordable, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, So if you're not interested in the logistics of going to a celebration or hearing the bad news of how certain things got completely screwed up, this probably isn't the episode for you. You probably want to move to the next episode. In the next episode, I'm going to try to keep all the negativity out of it, because there will be some in this episode, because we're going to talk about their screw-ups. I'm going to try to keep all the negativity out of it and just talk about what did we do, who did we meet, what did we get signed, show you some of the stuff picked up at Celebration, all that kind of stuff, the more positive side of the entire experience. So for those of you who are looking for just where was the fun, what was the cool aspect or aspects of Celebration, the next episode is the one you want to check out. Again, this one we're going to focus in on logistics. Sort of a, so you want to attend a celebration type of theme, and then along with that, some of the screw-ups um, that were made on their behalf that sort of marred the experience to a degree for us. Okay? So, that said, if you want to bow out now, time to jump away. Uh, Alright, so, Celebration this time was held at the Orange County Convention Center on International in Orlando, Florida. Uh, my wife and I, we live here in the Atlanta metro area, the southwest corner of the Atlanta metro area. So basically, it was about a six to seven hour drive, depending on traffic. Yes, even with part of the interstate having collapsed, because thankfully that's not on our route. Um, basically, uh, sort of a one day, one morning, one afternoon type of drive. We left here at around nine to ten or so o'clock, got there mid-afternoon, and we did all of our traveling on the day prior to the convention. The convention was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we drove in on Wednesday, attended Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then on Monday we drove back. So that gets us into some of the uh, logistics here to begin with. I would say, first of all, uh, when you're planning to go to a celebration, first thing, make sure that as soon as you know that you're going to be able to go, you know that this is something that's not going to change, get online, get your tickets fast. Uh, we got those four-day adult passes, right? The passes all have different artwork on them. In this case, Ray, and four-day adult. And we got that online, I want to say it was right around either October or August, I forget specifically, um, but it was before the end of the year, before they sold out of the four-day passes. They do eventually sell out of those. And it does seem as though Reed Pop, in this case, who runs the convention, it seems like they oversold the convention this time. Way more passes sold than really the capacity of the place really should have been able to take care of, should have been able to hold. Around 70,000 people attended this celebration. It was the biggest Star Wars celebration yet. But it seemed as though Reed Pop didn't take that into account when planning how this was going to go, nor did some of the vendors and whatnot on the inside. They treated it a little bit more like maybe a previous celebration or any other convention, not taking the numbers uh, into account. But you get the passes, and you can buy them day to day, but just bear in mind that the prices do vary. Uh, we've got our receipts still printed out from when we got this. 
Um, these adult four-day passes, for those who are thinking about the budgeting going ahead to go to a celebration, were $150 each. So between my wife and I, that was $300. Now, you notice the tinkling sound. They had these special lanyards here that you could order that look like the medals from A New Hope, right, that everybody but Chewie seems to have gotten. Uh, you had shirts that you could buy that were only available if you ordered online. Uh, and then there were these special commemorative guides, which, by the way, are really cool with their information, but really probably shouldn't be called a guide to celebration, because there is no guide to the actual events, when to be where, the floor plan of the building, or anything like that. It's more sort of a souvenir booklet that could go for any big Star Wars celebration, rather than something that feels like it's specific to Orlando. But if you wanted any of those... You could order them at the time you're ordering your tickets, and so we did. Each of those lanyards was $8 each. Each of those commemorative guides, the books, were $20 each, and each t-shirt was $25 each. So really, when buying $300 worth of tickets, we spent almost $450 actually in that initial transaction, which is all paid up front, online, months before the convention itself. Okay, so bear that in mind. When the time comes to start budgeting to attend a celebration, you will be wanting to order your tickets early, if at all possible. There may be extra stuff to get when you do, but just keep in mind there's sort of that initial burst of money spent, but then hopefully that's out the door, and you don't have to account for that as part of your budgeting for the actual trip itself. Um, you'll have your travel amounts, unless you happen to live in the area, and unless you're going to wind up staying with friends who live down there, or perhaps split the cost of a hotel with another group of people or another person who happens to be going, my wife and I chose not to do that because we wanted this to be something for us to go, not sharing a hotel room with anybody, just the two of us, then you are going to have to be planning for a hotel stay. And unfortunately, because of demand, because of location, because of how close many of these different hotels in the area are to the convention center, to an extent, the demand is artificially high. And it causes the prices to be somewhat high. Uh, we stayed in a three-star hotel, the Abante Resort, which really takes the definition of resort and stretches it about as far as it can go without snapping back in your face. And it was not necessarily the nicest of places. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. It was at a mile, mile point three or whatever from the convention center itself within walking distance, albeit a little bit longer walking distance than some of the other hotels. And we wound up staying Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, because again, we then left on Monday morning, and we got there that day previous. So we spent probably about seven to $800 just on the hotel itself. And I think we learned some lessons from that that hopefully might help those who are planning to attend a celebration in the future. One, think about distance and whether or not you're in a sweet spot, you might say, for the distance. If you are really, really close to wherever it's being held, you can walk. If you walk, goodbye dealing with any parking fees or anything like that. Just make sure it's a distance you can handle. And that's going to vary by person. Uh, we were, again, about a mile point three away. In theory, we could have walked, albeit a bit of a longer walk than what we might have expected otherwise. But my wife and I both have health issues. Uh, from the standpoint of the state of Georgia, we are both permanently disabled when it comes to anything that requires us to basically be in one place for a long period of time without being able to have a restroom or something nearby because we both have some form or another of IBS with something else to go with it. Um, so walking that distance was going to be a little bit iffy for both of us from a health standpoint. So we wound up in a position where in theory we could walk to it, but we really realistically weren't going to, which meant that even though we were close and paying a hotel price that was kind of a premium for being so close, we still wound up driving every day and paying $10 to park each day of the convention. So there's another 40 bucks out the window. What I would suggest is if you're not going to get something close enough to walk, whatever your walking distance preference happens to be, don't get one, a hotel that is, right near the convention center, wherever it's being held. Go two miles away, three miles away, five miles away, a 10-minute drive away, five-minute drive away. The farther away you get from the main attractions, for you're either able to spend the same amount of money and get a better quality hotel experience, or you can get the same level of hotel experience for quite a bit cheaper. Either way, you're saving money or getting a better experience out of it, rather than just getting close because, well, 
it's close, and I don't want to deal with the traffic aspect of it. So I'm going to just drive down one street to get to where I'm going. You're paying for that convenience. I would also suggest, especially for those who don't tend to do longer trips very often, uh, to make sure that your hotel room is going to have either a refrigerator or mini fridge or something like that uh, to keep drinks in and whatnot. Otherwise, you're going to want to bring a cooler and keep it fresh with ice. But also, maybe look for a place that has a little kitchenette or some type of like microwave or even, I kid you not, bring a microwave with you. What we found was that we wound up eating dinners out or eating food away from the hotel with the exception of like a couple days of doing room service that was actually reasonable at this particular place, um, pretty much for every meal. And that adds up very, very quickly. Uh, you definitely also want to try to eat your meals, if at all possible, away from the convention center where it's being held. Because once you're inside, you're a captive audience. Unless you want to leave and come back and pay parking again, or leave and come back and have to walk through security again, you're going to be eating at one of the food establishments actually inside the convention center. And these are prices that would put, I'm in the Atlanta area, so the old Turner Field or the new SunTrust Park for the Atlanta Braves to shame from a price standpoint. Uh, our first lunch there was at Nathan's Hot Dogs. And I'll admit, really, really good hot dogs. But two regular hot dogs, two bottled waters, two soft drinks, $24. The next time we actually ate there at the convention center, Ezra's, I kid you not, Ezra's Barbecue. Two quick pulled pork sandwiches, a Gatorade, a soft drink, $30. Okay. So we're talking some serious price inflation inside the building where these things are being held. But you can save yourself a lot of money by eating elsewhere. And if you are able to eat elsewhere and get a portion large enough to take it back with you, essentially in a box as leftovers, if you've got a little fridge, if you've got something to warm it up with, you can again save money on the food, unless you just bring food with you. But for a long stretch of time, that's a little trickier to do and keep everything, you know, fresh, refrigerated and that sort of thing, especially if you're traveling uh, by car. So there's a lot of money wrapped up in parking, possibly wrapped up in your accommodations, wrapped up in food, and then, of course, wrapped up in initially getting your tickets and anything else to go with that. And that is all before, really, with the exception of the food, if you're buying from a vendor inside, pretty much all before you walk in the door. Once you're inside, then you have certain events that are going to cost you a bit of money. Um, for instance, you've got books being sold and whatnot at the Barnes & Noble booth, at the Del Rey booth, generally with no discount on them, basically at full price most of the time. Uh, if you want to buy anything for the Celebration store, we'll talk about the logistics of that in a moment, then that's a lot of stuff in there. Quite a few exclusives, but again, it's going to cost you a bit. You've got to budget ahead of time to bring the money for it. Um, in particular... The way the autographs work at Celebration, there's a clear dividing line between your, uh, you might do a call the expanded universe type talent, the, the writers of the books and the comics and the artists and people like that, versus the actors and actresses from the movies, uh, which I would assume is based on contractual stuff. So if I want to get something signed by an author, I just uh, go to that booth where that author is signing, stand in line, bring something up or buy something, come up, get it signed, that's it. All I've spent is time and maybe the money to buy whatever that item was that I got signed. If it is an actor or actress, you are buying either a photo op opportunity or an autograph opportunity, an autograph ticket, basically, to be able to get something signed by that person. You buy those generally ahead of time, and we're talking hundreds of dollars in many cases. Uh, go to the website for Star Wars Authentics. That's who handles the, uh, the autographs and whatnot now, and they were handling it at Celebration as well. And we're talking a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, I am very curious for when we do Cloud City Casino's recap of Celebration to talk to Michael Morris because I know he and his wife did some photo ops with some of the actors and actresses. And I'm really curious how much they had wound up paying out of pocket to be able to do that. Because for my wife and I, that was absolutely cost prohibitive. There was no way in hell we were going to be able to do that. Um, and I will say up front, from a cost standpoint, put all this stuff together, the food the stuff you're buying inside, the hotel, the tickets and everything. Um, if we were to assume that when you buy something, uh, anything that you're going to finance, that what we're thinking about is the cost up front, like the down payment, rather than the financing over time, then I think the only thing my wife and I, and I in my life, have ever done that was more expensive than this trip to Star Wars Celebration was buying our house. Getting the cars that we have, 
the car that I had before when I had a Mustang, uh, what we paid out of pocket for that, what we paid out of pocket uh, initially getting into a master's program and things like that, uh, moving from Indiana to Georgia and all the expenses tied up in that, all less expensive up front than our experience with Star Wars Celebration Orlando, and we didn't buy a single celebrity autograph or photo op or visit the Celebration store. So again, this is a very pricey experience, but you can cut that down by your choices of how to eat, where to eat, where to get a hotel from, uh, what to get ahead of time when you get your tickets, uh, and your accommodations. It's really something that those who live in the area are able to benefit from quite a bit more than those who are coming from out of state, particularly those coming in from out of state as we were who don't really know the area at all and don't have a chance to really do a whole lot of research ahead of time to know a lot of these things that we learned along the way as um, suggestions of things that might be able to make the experience a little cheaper, a little smoother. So logistically, there are ways to make it cheaper, but understand that attending a Star Wars celebration, unless you live in the area, is, and unless just, you know, way one person, this is not an experience from a financial standpoint to take lightly. Budget, 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 or you're going to be accumulating quite a bit of debt doing so. Um, all right, so that said, logistics otherwise. Logistics actually in celebration. Um, they did do something different this time. We'll talk about this as a negative here soon. But they did do something different this time in that Reed Pop wanted to up the level of security. So rather than having people just come in or come in through a metal detector or come in, put your stuff down and have the wand, you know, TSA style, go over you to do metal detection, they were also checking any bags that were being brought into the center. Um, so they did up that, so you have to plan a little bit of time to be checked for that. That also made lines pretty long to get in. It slowed the line process down quite a bit. Um, once you are inside the place, it's basically one, in, in this case, it's one giant convention center area with different levels and such. And you have essentially a top level that's the galaxy stage. That's where the main events tend to happen. A third level that has most of your other panels, uh, your podcast stage, your collector stage, and all that type of thing, um, plus access to the galaxy stage and the collector stage, or the, uh, excuse me, the celebration stage. Collector's up there, too, but celebration's the one I was thinking of just then. Uh, and then you have sort of this main floor that you enter down here at the bottom, and notice there on the left it says show floor. So you have a bunch of basically lines and stuff to get ready for various panels and whatnot, but then you pass through a big set of doors and you're into the show floor. And the show floor is what's up here at the top. Notice all those small squares, tons and tons of little booths that you can stop at. There's a food court down there where that Nathan's Hot Dogs and the Ezra's Barbecue are. Um, and as part of that, you also have an area set aside as a celebration store and an area set aside for autographs. Again, autographs requiring tickets for the photo ops or the autographs themselves. Now, the way this is divided up, there are different, again, different stages. You have fan tables, you have uh, uh, basically all these different uh, exhibitors out there, different vendors and whatnot, some uh, independent businesses, and then some that are licensees like Del Rey and whatnot that have uh, their stuff set up down there. You have the uh, main stage, again, the galaxy stage. You have the celebration stage. Uh, you have the behind-the-scenes stage, the Star Wars fan stage, the Star Wars collector's stage, the Star Wars University area, uh, the Celebration podcast stage, the Rebels Theater, where they were just playing episodes of Rebels um, throughout the entire time. And you have a schedule all set up as a grid letting you know where to go. Now, this is a program you just get free either up at the front when you do registration or you just pick it up from somebody who's handing them out that'll let you know when anything is. Again, the one that you actually buy for like 20 bucks gives you none of that information and you still have to pick this up at registration. Um, they sent out the t-shirts, the lanyards, and what was the other thing? Um, the tickets. They sent those all out in separate packages, sort of staggered in the weeks leading up to the celebration. Try to make sure that you're able to order your tickets well enough in advance that they can mail them to you rather than having to wait in the registration line when you get there. You can always circle back as we did to pick up anything sitting at the registration desk for you. But whatever you do, don't put yourself in a position where you're making getting in an even longer experience than it already is. So speaking of lines and such, uh, again, the main events are on the galaxy stage. So we're talking about things like the 40th anniversary uh, thing, the Last Jedi panel and whatnot. And in those cases, they also have since instances, excuse me, 
where they'll have other rooms for other stages, so to speak, that are really just set up as overflow rooms to watch live on a television screen what's happening on that main uh, galaxy stage or celebration stage, as the case may be. Well, obviously, you're going to have a lot of demand to get into those panels. And the way that it works is basically they are wristbands that you have to get. So you can line up first thing in the morning, or, and they did this in a sanctioned way this time, stay overnight at the convention center when they lock the doors at a certain point, um, stay in there, and basically stay in line the entire night. So then when they start in the morning giving out those wristbands, you are first in line. You line up for whichever panel it is that you want to go to, and when you get to the front of the line, if there are still some wristbands left, either for that main event or for one of the overflow rooms for it, you get the little wristband. And if you want, you can get in line for another of those and keep going and going and going until you have two wristbands total that wind up being either for something on the, the uh, galaxy stage or the celebration stage. And then when the time comes for those panels, you line up and that wristband is what gets you inside. What that means logistically is that if you are not someone who's going to get there as early in the morning, as I put it, or who's going to stay overnight, good freaking luck getting into any of the major events. Not really likely to happen. Uh, we were lucky we were able to get into the Warwick Davis small talk, a little kind of like talk show type event, and that's only because there was an opening area in the balcony where that didn't have enough people in it, and there were people outside like Carnival Barker saying, you know, Warwick Davis, anybody for Warwick Davis? to let us come in and sit in the balcony for that. We certainly didn't get in line at like 5 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning, as the case may be, and we certainly didn't stay overnight. Now, on the one hand, I would argue that at least by having sort of a sanctioned overnight thing, by having people in the building locking the doors, having access to the facilities, the restrooms, even keeping concessions open, on the one hand, yeah, that legitimizes this idea of, well, it's not just everybody shows up in the morning and gets in line. Those that somehow have the ability to spend the night and go hardcore get all the advantages. Yes, but it's done in a safer way than it otherwise would have been. Because if they had that closed, you know people would have been sitting in line outside. They would have been just sleeping in their cars in the nearest parking lot, which was, by the way, pretty much always full because of people who just never left. Um, basically, it's sort of a... If it's going to happen, why not do it in the safest way possible? And to their credit, Reed Pop came up with a way to do it that seemed like it was a fairly safe process. It still sucks for anyone who is paying for a hotel and intended to use it, or had little kids that they weren't going to stay overnight with, uh, and that sort of thing, you know, to be able to be in line and get into those panels. But it was better handled than it possibly could have been. Uh, but again, that means that if you are attending Celebration, most people attending Celebration are in what they refer to as the Celebration Bubble, which means you're busy running around the building doing something while the main events are going on, so you're going to wind up seeing the main events the way everybody else does at home, watching the live stream either as it's happening on your phone or usually after the fact on YouTube or something, so you're not getting all the new information as it's coming. You know, when they announce something, or say, like, for instance, the trailer, last Jedi trailer, the new uh, a teaser, Airs, everybody's psyched, but most people actually on the convention floor hadn't seen it. We didn't see it until we left and got a better cell phone reception to watch it on that or went back to our hotel and got on a computer or something. Um, so just understand that if you're attending Celebration, to be able to be like, I want to be in there whenever they have the whole crew on uh, all in the one discussion, that'll be so sweet. It may not happen, and if you're going to make it happen, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to stay overnight in line, or you're going to have to get up incredibly early and hope that you still are able to get in there, because otherwise the chances of being able to make it into those major panels are slim to none. Okay? Uh, you, your celebration experience for most celebration goers, when it comes to the major panels, is going to be watching it online like everybody else at home. However, um, other panels, the ones that aren't on those stages or the overflow rooms for them, which sometimes were for instance, uh, the behind-the-scenes stage as an overflow room. Those, you just got in line for. No wristbands or anything like that. Just get in line, and it fills in, and then once it's full, you're done, right? And you can't get in. Um, but they had quite large areas. For instance, when Michael Morris did his collecting panel, that was a fairly large room to be able to get people into for that panel. And that worked just like any other panel at any other convention. Just go, get in line, come on in, you're good. As long as there's space, you're fine. Um, so the wristbands did not apply in that case. 
Um, the Celebration Store is another thing you could sort of preload yourself for. A lot of the exclusives to be found, thankfully not the Thrawn book, which we'll talk about, um, but a lot of the exclusives to be found were found in the Celebration Store, which is a separate area of the main show floor. You could either just get in line, and it would take you a very long time to actually get in there because it was one of the largest lines in the entire thing outside of getting in on the first day. Or, if you got there, again, crazy early in the morning, instead of going and getting a wristband for a panel, you could get access to what's referred to as the light speed lane, which is basically where they give you a special time to come back, and if you come back at that specific time, you immediately get in, you bypass uh, uh, the line and everything, you just go and get your stuff and go, because you've already come in early and gotten your ticket. I'm assuming the reason for that is so that it's not so many people crammed at the very beginning, that at least some of the people there at the beginning come back later and it thins out things a little faster in the morning. Um, but it's a quick access type thing if you're there early and get in line to be able to get a pass to get into it. So you're still lining up. It's just you're lining up to get that and then coming back at a time that's more convenient, hopefully, to you. So you can still do other things that morning. Uh, you're queuing up the same type of thing for autographs, but you've already got your tickets and they have a little sign, uh, a little um, screen up that tells you, you know, who's doing what when. If you wanted to see Star Wars uh, show live, that was really just a matter of just being in the center of the crowd down there on the main floor. Star Wars show was doing their live coverage right there um, from the middle of the show floor with uh, Andy Gutierrez and her partner doing that. I haven't really watched Star Wars show. I probably should. Uh, should be something I'll binge watch at some point. Um, I just know her from Rebels Recon. Um, but they had some cool things going on there. They had t-shirt giveaways and whatnot, stars showing up to say hello and things like that. That was just something you could get in on regardless of where you were. Photo ops with uh, the different props and whatnot. Like, I've got a picture of me really, really tiny, because I'm kind of short, in front of a giant at, -AT. Um, Just, they're on the show floor, walk up to them, and once, you know, the crowd kind of clears, step in front, take a picture, that's it. So we're sort of in and out. Um, author signings. Same type of thing. Sign up, just get in line, or not sign up, just get in line, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to get to the author to get something signed. Although, even beforehand, Del Rey was letting people know when it came to books that if you were to go to a signing at the Del Rey booth, there is no purchase required. However, by policy at least, um, for Barnes & Noble signings, you were supposed to have bought something from Barnes & Noble's little station there uh, at Celebration in order to be allowed to be in the line to get something signed at a Barnes & Noble signing, although it was not something necessarily ever checked. We'll get to that when we talk about where they sort of fell flat on their faces. So expect lots of time spent in lines. Plan out what you want to see, and don't necessarily bank everything on getting into any of those wristbanded major events. Have other things that you want to do. The show You could lose yourself an entire day. In fact, we did, really, on the first day, on just the show floor, checking out the different vendors and getting signings and stuff done with authors and all that kind of stuff. But you could also spend an entire day in the completely different, less crowded atmosphere of going from panel to panel to panel and hearing people talk about interesting Star Wars topics. And the topics were pretty good. It seemed like, for the most part, uh, as you look through the different panels that were available. Uh, some of the panels even gave away free stuff as you left those panels to, as an enticement to get people into the panels in the first place. So, just again, think of the Celebration experience as uh, fairly expensive, so budget ahead. Um, lots of lines, so budget your time ahead. And something where you're not necessarily going to see everything you ideally would want to see because of the large crowds. So have some backup plans and other things you want to do in mind. Um, and try to be as much as in a go-with-the-flow type of attitude as possible, because things can change. Um, there will be disappointments. There will be times where the people running it fall flat on their faces. But there will also be these great moments of speaking with other fans, meeting people you may have known for years online who you've never met in person before, um, getting to talk to people behind the scenes of the books, the comics, the movies, the TV shows, whatever, um, and just soaking in the atmosphere. Um, so good experience, but understand that it it's pretty crowded and pretty expensive um, overall. If you, like my wife, tend to have anxiety sometimes in large crowds, try to find ways to separate yourself out from it or have a game plan where you can go from point A to point B without having a lot of, uh, of questioning in the middle so that the anxiety levels are kept a little low. Um, there was a quiet room set up for those who had extreme cases of anxiety, but honestly... Uh, it was just like one little area, so I'm not entirely sure how beneficial that was. But at least it was nice that they had it for people 
um, who might have actually needed it. So while we're on the topic of logistics, um, there were three instances, uh, all from different groups, in which, uh, again, I call this the cluster boink, the cluster F-bomb, uh, of just where there was some mismanagement and some misunderstanding or uh, underestimating of fan demand for certain things, where it just created some messes that really heavily negatively impacted my wife and I's experience while we were there. Um, one of them set the stage so much for the first day that I think we enjoyed aspects of the first day at Celebration in retrospect. But if you had asked me on that day how much we really enjoyed it, I would have said, F this. Uh, in fact, as you may recall, on the little update that I put up on the first day of Celebration, the second of those updates, because I did put one out the day we got there, I said my wife and I had pretty much decided we will never go to another Celebration. And I think that we are still of the mind financially it's probably not worth it, and given the lines and such, we probably won't choose to go to another celebration, but we at least are in the, the mood to say we could be convinced now. But after that first day and the first of these complete screw-ups, uh, we were ready to say screw it to ever doing another celebration. And then we had a couple instances later where there was just a mismanagement aspect that just didn't work and heavily colored not just those days, but also our experience and the experience of others. So I want to get into those, again, to get all the negative stuff out of the way here so that as we go forward, the next episode can be all of our positive experiences. So number one, the first day. Getting into the building was completely effed up. Uh, Reed Pop absolutely dropped the ball on this. Understand that what you've got here is a convention center that has different uh, wings, north, south, uh, east, west, whatever. The convention was in the west area. Okay. Um, and basically, there's a main set of doors. And what apparently had happened was as people lined up, they just had them continue lining up outside. Because, again, the doors were only going to open at a specific time. I think it was like 10 o'clock. Um, but also, everybody had to pass through security. And security was up to this time, so it's not just putting your stuff down and getting wanded or putting your stuff down and walking through a metal detector. It was a bag check. They would actually look inside your bag, in theory, to see what was in there. Uh, now, let me kind of pause for a second just, and just hit the bag check thing here. Um, the bag check thing really did slow things down. And for those who were coming from where we were, which is a south parking lot, you actually passed through one area where they were supposed to be checking bags but didn't. And they just kind of wanted you real quick and pointed you away. But they pointed you to another line to get into the main line to get in, which would have you go through metal detection all over again. There was a redundancy there that really shouldn't have been there and wasn't there the subsequent days where they actually pointed you straight into the building right next to that particular check if you're coming in from that direction. But on the first day, they only had one door open being manned and managed. They got to a point where they finally just said, screw it, because it was taking too long, and basically completely dropped the ball when it came to security and checking bags. They were just like, screw it, just just, just go, just go, just go, just go. Uh, so they slowed down the entire process and made a complete mess of day one's entrance, all in the name of increased security. And in the process, wound up getting to a point where they just said, screw it, and undermined any security measures they had managed to do because they were just letting people in without checking really much of anything by that set, by that uh, that later part of the first day. And even once they got more checkpoints and more doors open, to their credit, on the other days to let people in, they were still wanding people and letting them in these other entrances, but their bag checks were very cursory. They slowed things down immensely, but it was still just basically, yeah, there you go, go, oh, there you go, go. Um, there were times when my wife with her purse, they were just like, don't worry about it, you're fine, it's just a purse. Just a purse, really. Um, and it struck me, given that I was wearing a backpack most of the days and a little, like, thing that goes over my shoulder um, that I got from GAETC, the Georgia Educational Technology Conference, to hold some stuff on the later days. And it struck me when I got back, and don't worry, no issues here. For home security, my wife and I bought this earlier this year. Don't worry. Nothing in the chamber, no magazine in it, no worries. Um, but this is about the size of a little bit bigger than my hand. I could very easily have stuck this in the bottom of my bag, and they never would have seen it. It never would have passed through a metal detector because you were sitting your bags off to the side and you were getting checked with a metal detector. The bags never did. 
and the bags themselves only got that cursory glance before going in. So they completely made a mess out of the first day, slowed everything down for people getting in, all in the name of security that, in practice, really was not secure at all. Because they weren't checking well enough, and in most cases, they were just waving people through on that first day. Now, I'm someone who would say that as long as someone has a legal right to carry, and that place doesn't have a prohibition, let them carry. It's the people who are trying to sneak in and do something bad with it that you got to worry about. But if someone was just carrying lawfully for security, it's okay. I mean, that's a Second Amendment rights kind of thing. You see that in the Atlanta area quite a bit. Uh, where people just carry, and they're not doing anything nefarious. They just happen to be armed. Um, but it was sort of a, we're going to make sure that nothing gets through. Oh, crap. It's taking too long. That's all right. Anything can get through. And what good did that do? So, in essence, they sort of be betrayed their own intentions in giving up, basically, on doing a check. Again, we, anybody could have gone in and done just about anything. Um and the, the the cursory checks were not were just like a quick kind of thing. It wasn't like a TSA type of scanner thing. So if you were carrying something on you that wasn't metal that was still deadly, they would never have caught it. Um, but in doing these security checks, and in only having one door open on the morning of the first day, it became a big mess because you had the building, right? And outside the building, you would come out and curve, if you're looking at the building, off to the right in a line. And you can sort of see this as we came in, but we weren't quite sure where it was coming in from, but you had a line. What happened was that line went out and out, around the building, around an adjacent building, down and down and down and down and down and down and down, and down to the next overpass off the nearest road, curved around and came back that entire distance, got back to the front door... And it still needed someplace to go and wound up going all in front of the convention center, weaving in like a snake kind of thing, before then crossing the adjacent road and continuing on. Um, it was ridiculous. It was to the, and nobody knew really where it ended and where it began, like where it, and where it looped around. So every time you'd be walking around the building and turn a corner, you'd hope to see that that's where the line turned back and finally started going the other direction as it snaked around. But no, it wouldn't. And then the next time, it wouldn't. The next time, it wouldn't. It just kept going and going and going. Um, the end result was that we got there a little bit before the doors opened. We got there at about, you know, like a little before 10 o'clock, you know, 9.30 to 10 o'clock kind of thing. We knew we'd be standing in line, but we figured they'd be checking people and just going in fairly quickly. Um, we wound up standing in line outside in the Orlando heat and direct sunlight for two and a half hours before ever getting inside. And that's with them finally saying, screw it, whatever, when it came to security. Go ahead, bring your gun in, we don't give a shit. Oopsie. Now I already did. I already swear. Um, and it's just, again, for some, they're like, this is nothing. You should expect that from a celebration. Well, I expect competence out of the company running it. I've gone to other conventions. I expect competence and multiple entry points. If you're going to sue security, I expect you to be able to do it quickly and efficiently. Um, I do not expect you to have this massive weight of hours. Uh, and in doing so with this giant line, also not to have anybody on security who's nearby. There was nobody watching the line. We had a group of people, uh, basically four assholes, who decided to jump into the line a bit ahead of where me and my wife were. The people a bit behind us started yelling at them. They started yelling back, and a fist fight almost broke out. You're the asshole. No, you're the dick. You're the dick. You're the, I'm going to kick your ass kind of stuff back and forth. Nobody from security, nobody on staff, anywhere near to do anything about this. It was either going to be a fight or they just stay in the line. Absolutely no policing of anything like that at all. If you're going to have a line that's going to take two and a half hours to get through and stretch at least a mile or more, you need people outside to keep an eye on things to make sure that it is going the way that it's supposed to. As it stood, the only people I saw out there on security at all were at the end point where it turned and started turning completely back on itself. The rest of the line, completely and utterly unpoliced. Um, that was a mistake. Um, but staying out there in the heat, again, some people this is no problem. We've done this at other Star Wars celebrations before. Yeah, yeah, okay. There are people with health issues. 
my wife, me, um, standing outside, outside in the heat for two and a half hours with the health issues that we have, which is not something that we, I mean, maybe we should have gotten medical stickers to be able to jump to the front of the line, but because we are generally capable of most things, just have those issues, um, we don't feel like that is appropriate most of the time. Um, so we just, we're going to attend like anybody else is going to attend. And maybe, again, we should have gotten those badges because after two and a half hours, we were feeling horrible. We were feeling terrible. We, she had actually been ill before also. She was recovering from surgery and had, had had sinus stuff going on. I was starting to get sick. Um, and it all just got exacerbated to the point where waiting outside for that two and a half hours ruined the entire experience for that day. Completely. Um, and by the time we got in, there were still people waiting in line behind us. And wait for it. Partway through, they decided to open up another set of doors. Remember how I said it went all the way around and back and then snaked over here? So the back of the line is that little snaky area, and the main line is that long one stretching. They opened the doors closer to the little back end and let a whole bunch of people from the end who only had to wait like 10 minutes into the building immediately when they opened those doors, whereas everybody who was still in that mile long or so line, yeah, screw you, you're still waiting. You've still got another 45 minutes to an hour to wait to get inside. Every step of the way in how they handled the entry process on day one was messed up. They absolutely fouled it up. And to their credit, I keep saying that, to their credit, to balance it out, to be fair, uh, Disney apparently read them the riot act that night. They fixed it and had a better setup by the next day for all the rest of the days. And Reed Pop, uh, apparently their contract to do these conventions is coming to an end anyway. And it looks like Disney will not be uh, re-upping that contract. They will simply let the contract expire and somebody else will be handling future celebrations. Hopefully, at least that's what I'm hearing. Uh, but if you know you've got something like 70,000 people who are going to be coming through, or at least a huge portion of that coming through on that first day, don't have just one door. Have your security stuff taken care of on the inside so that it's nice and efficient. Have people watching the line outside. Um, handle it better. And instead, they dropped the ball. Um, and for some, not a biggie for my wife and I with our health concerns. Um, it was a day killer, really, in many ways for day one. Thankfully, we did have some good experience still on day one, which we'll talk about in the next uh, vlog episode here. And our experiences were quite a bit better on the subsequent days. Like I said, it's not a definite we will never go to a celebration again so much as it's a we could be convinced. But it looks like just logistically, financially, it is it's not worthwhile enough to do another. We're glad we were able to do one, probably wouldn't wind up doing another. Major logistical foul up number two goes down to Del Rey and Barnes and Noble, though apparently more Del Rey than Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble was just a distributor, it seems, in this case. The big exclusive being announced and promoted for Star Wars Celebration Orlando was this. This is the celebration exclusive version of the novel Thrawn released about a week or so prior to the convention itself. It has a different cover, a different back. If you look inside, and we'll look at more of this later, it's got a different uh, interior design. It says celebration on there, etc., etc. And you can, of course, get this signed because Timothy Zahn was right there uh, on the convention floor. Also, uh, while you could purchase multiple copies of this, uh, each person was limited to one of a special giveaway, and the giveaway turned out to be this. A little Thrawn pin. Okay? So regardless if you bought five, one, ten, twenty, whatever, one pin per person. And apparently, they very heavily underestimated the demand for this book. This is one of the single most hotly anticipated Star Wars novels in years, if not decades. And they completely underestimated how many people would actually want to purchase a copy at celebration of that exclusive version, which apparently, I'm hearing anecdotally, was limited to about 2,000 or so. And again, there were about 70,000 people attending celebration. Um, what wound up happening was that there was a massive, massive shortage, partly because people were coming in and buying it uh, because they wanted the book, partly because they turned these pins into like a scavenger hunt. The thing to collect at Celebration was these pins. And there were a lot of people coming up, apparently, buying the book, not caring about the book, 
because they wanted the pins. And the only way to get the pin was to buy the book. It wasn't just buy something from Del Rey or buy something at the Barnes & Noble booth. It was buy this specific book to get the pin. So anyone who wanted the pin and was willing to drop 35 bucks basically to get the pin and then a book to presumably sell on eBay or something uh, would then come up and artificially add to the demand for the book. So as we're standing in line uh, during that two hour stretch or two and a half hour stretch outside, we've still got about 45 minutes to an hour to go before getting inside. Um, technically, the convention itself has been open for only about an hour and a half to two hours at this point. And Del Rey puts out a tweet and puts out a little update that basically says, we seem to have underestimated demand for Thrawn. There are still some available, but get it soon, blah, blah, blah. What does that do? It ups the demand again, or at least ups the demand at that moment for people who otherwise would have waited till later to try to get it zipping in. And keep in mind that most people did think they were going to be able to buy this later, because for every signing that Zahn did um, by himself, listed as a Thrawn signing, uh, with the exception of the very last one, if you look at their descriptions on the Celebration website or, and, and whatnot, basically it said, come buy a copy of the exclusive version of Thrawn and get it signed, which made it sound as though he was supposed to have a stock of these exclusive editions beside him every time he did a signing. That was not the case. There weren't any boxes of these like set aside for each individual signing. It was first come, first serve at the Del Rey booth or Barnes & Noble. Get them while you can. So while we're standing in line, we see that tweet, and I know that Michael Morris is already inside. Thank goodness he and his wife, Christy, are already inside. I say, hey, are you in a position to be able to grab a copy of Thrawn? Because they just sent out a thing saying that they're, they're somewhat limited. Is there any way you can grab one and I can pay you back? And he says, yeah, no, I'm in a great position to do that. No problem. He winds up being able to go and get me a copy of the book. And at the time, they still had the little pins. We finally get inside, and the first thing we do once we get inside about 45 minutes to an hour later is make a beeline straight for what we thought was a Del Rey booth initially, but going straight to Barnes & Noble instead uh, to get copies of this. Because I had promised uh, Michael Yankovic, who is the, the mixer, the editor for Star Wars Beyond the Films, uh, and Chris Walker, a good friend from really years and years of online Star Wars stuff and the uh, fan audio community, uh, and I had promised Barrett Lawton, who of course is from... Uh, Republic Forces Radio Network, and Rebels Roundtable, now doing Padawan Perspective uh, with Mark Herleman. Uh, I had promised them that I'd be able to try at least to get them a copy of the book. I knew I probably couldn't get them a pin because it was limited to one per person, but I'd at least try to get them a copy of the book. Uh, and I decided very early on that if I could get my hands on another copy, I would make it a point to try to grab one for Mark Herleman, my co-host from Star Wars Beyond the Films, because he couldn't make it, and I know he would do the same for me. So we made a beeline straight there. By the time we got there, they were not sitting out on the table. And instead, you had to ask for them specifically when you got to the end. Although, that was only sort of you asking. If you didn't ask for one, they would say, were you wanting to pick up this also? So they were kind of pushing the book as well. Uh, but you get to the end of the line, ask for them. And again, there was no limit on how many you could get. Now, I got some eyes later because I picked up several of them and got them all signed at once. Because uh, I was picking up ones for various people, plus I had the one that uh, Michael dropped off um, that he picked up for me. Um, but even if they had had it down to a limit to two per person, we still would have wound up getting the same number that we got, because Michael would have grabbed one because he wasn't picking up one for himself. I would have been able to grab two. My wife would have been able to grab two. We'd still have wound up with five different copies. Um, but you would think that there would have been a limit of some kind, either just two per person, even if it's a one per person, but no limit was there. It was just however many you could afford at $35 a pop which is a higher price than the regular cover price for the book. What that meant, though, with that high demand, was that by the time Zahn did his first signing at the Barnes & Noble booth that afternoon, which I think was his second signing scheduled for the day, the books were gone. Not only had they burned through all of their Celebration exclusive copies, they'd burned through all the Barnes & Noble exclusive copies and all the regular copies of the Thrawn novel. There were none. And one of the stipulations they were giving at that Barnes & Noble signing was not just you need to have bought something for Barnes & Noble to be able to go to this signing. It was you need to have a copy of Thrawn to get signed. Now, I don't know if they did that for any other ones for him, but at least for that first one, it was you need to have a copy of Thrawn to get signed to be in this signing. And if you don't have one yet, nothing we can do. They're all gone at Delray and Barnes & Noble both. Drastically, drastically underestimated 
the demand for these. So in that sense, that was a screw up because they didn't print enough. I mean, if it's going to be a celebration exclusive, of course it's going to be a celebration exclusive. You know that was the only place to get it. Does it matter if it's 2,000 versus 3,000 versus 4,000 that are printed? Not really, because it's still a limited number in just from that event. All you're doing by making it smaller, just making it harder for people to get it and probably upping the secondary market prices on eBay for later. Or from the standpoint of actually getting it to people, there probably should have been more stock in the first place. There probably should have been more of the pins, because the pens themselves were available, again, as you came up the first time. So when Michael Morris went to get my copy, he was able to get this. By the time my wife and I got up there to get the other copies, they were out of them, and instead were giving away a poster with Thrawn on one side and the Aftermath trilogy on the back. So they were giving out something, but the pens were long gone by basically within about an hour to hour and a half of when the show opened, hour to two hours, I guess, of when the show open. They didn't have enough pins. They didn't have enough copies of the book. Certainly not enough to last for all four days, or even to have enough for all the different signings that in the program made it sound like you could buy them at the signings. What they wound up doing was digging to see if they could find any more exclusive copies to make available on day two. When they did, they basically announced, hey, come by so and such a place, and we have a, a process ready to be able to deal with these things. And what they did was basically a lottery. You would show up, you'd be able to basically pick, you know, an item, and when you picked it up, that was able to tell you whether you won or not, and if you won, you got access to being able to purchase a copy of the exclusive version of Thrawn. But even that, they couldn't do right. What happened was, people would start showing up for that like an hour, hour and a half early, because they really wanted a copy of the book. And the people that, that were at that little station would say, no, we're not lining up right now, don't worry, and if you try to line up right now, we're going to disperse the line, and half an hour before, that's where we're going to actually let a real line be created. Now, the whole idea of we're going to make a line half an hour before was something Barnes & Noble was pushing quite a bit before any signings that they had. It never wound up being half an hour. It always wound up being like 45 minutes to an hour when people would line up, because they would never disperse those already lining up. They would just let people continue to line up. So half an hour, if you showed up actually half an hour before a signing, good freaking luck, you're way back in the line. Uh, you've been, you know, missing like the first four, uh, 15 minutes to half an hour of the line. But in this case, they were flat out telling people, no, you cannot get in line. We will disperse. We will disperse. We will disperse. Time finally comes for them to set up the real line. They say, screw it. You guys are here. We'll just let this line that formed that we kept telling other people was going to be dispersed be the beginning of the line. So anybody who actually took them at their word left or stepped aside, expecting that line to be dispersed and to actually have a real line set up when they said it was going to be, got completely screwed and wound up in the back of the line and never got a chance to get up there and draw a little ticket thing to have even a chance in hell of getting a copy of the book. Those who basically disobeyed what the instructions were benefited. Just like with the outside line, those who showed up really, really late benefited and got in when those other doors opened and everybody who got there Hours before, we're still screwed and standing in the line. Um, in any event, the way that the exclusive copy of Thrawn was handled was pretty much a mess. I was incredibly lucky. Um, but I know a lot of people who weren't able to get their hands on it. And when that signing came, um, there were some angry people because several of us had multiple copies to get signed. Um, you know, We paid our money for them. There was no limit. We're not putting them on eBay or something like that. At least, I wasn't. Um, but they were like, you know, gosh, I wish I could have bought one of those kind of death glare kind of things going on. Um, but they, they should have either limited it or something. They either, either limit the thing um, by regulation, um, handle the line better, handle your supply better, have more of them printed, have more pins available, uh, actually stick to your word when it comes to the way you're going to handle those copies that you found. Uh, again, the whole Thrawn exclusive was effed up. Another screw up of people falling flat on their faces running things. In that case, uh, being seemingly Del Rey. Which brings us to the last day. And the only thing my wife and I actually went to that day at Celebration itself, um, or excuse me, not the last day, the day before last, day before last, the Saturday, uh, was Ahsoka. There was a special signing going on, which was the only time that author E.K. Johnston would be signing copies of Ahsoka. And along with it, Ashley Eckstein was there, which is pretty cool, and Mark Thompson was there, though 
Why is kind of iffy. I mean, he had nothing to do with the Ahsoka novel or audiobook, apparently. Um, but three people signing, one of which was Ashley Eckstein, doing her only signing outside of, like, the autograph room. Um, giant draw. And they seem to have no clue to expect a big line at this Barnes & Noble booth event. So, again, the line starts growing, in this case, about an hour, maybe a little more than an hour, before the actual signing itself. Um, whips around, whips around, whips around. Gigantic line. Um, I would say that line was about a quarter of the size of the line outside, which by and large would make it about twice as long as even the Zahn lines that I saw um, for signings inside. Gigantic line. And unfortunately, once the signing started, um, the line it moved very slowly because it was three people to check in with to get signed. Um, but the problems didn't start when we said go, the problems actually started before that, because they came back through the line. Uh, this was a different team than on the previous days. The previous days, Barnes & Noble teams were actually pretty solid, um, pretty efficient at what they were doing. They were run by the same lady, um, short lady, red hair, um, as was running it on the day of the Eckstein signing. But the staff that was with that lady were all different um, those first couple of days and very efficient at what they did. This time was very different. Um they started passing along a message via a person who was helping keep the line straight, um, which is this lady, kind of about my height, glasses, um, said she had a fiancé who shared my first name. Um, uh, but the message they gave her to go and tell everyone uh, in the line was that the rules basically had changed. That if you're going to get something signed at the Barnes & Noble booth for this, you not only have to have bought something from the Barnes & Noble booth sometime within this weekend, which they'd never checked, with the exception of trying to make sure you had a copy of Thrawn to get signed, and if it was exclusive, of course you bought it there that weekend. Um, but they said that if you were not able to prove it with a receipt, you would be asked to leave the line. By that point, we had spent two to three hundred dollars on books, uh, if you count the ones I was picking up for other people at the Barnes & Noble booth, and they said Barnes & Noble or Del Rey, either one. Um, throughout the course of the weekend up to that point, but they were all on previous days. I didn't have any of the receipts with me. So they basically said, well, you know, if you've got somebody else in your party, you can have somebody stay here in line and you can run and buy something to make sure you have a receipt. Fine, whatever. Barnes & Noble line's incredibly long, not just for the signing, but another one that is going just for people to try to buy something. No way I'm getting in that line. I checked Del Rey. Del Rey's got a big, long line, but it's for a signing for Delilah Dawson and Christy Golden not to buy something. Thankfully, if you wanted to buy something, you just grab it, go to the cash register, and you're done. So I bought a $45 audiobook that I had no need for, and thankfully, my friend George was willing to buy after the fact because he wanted it, um, but bought something I didn't need so I could have a freaking receipt to be able to not get kicked out of the Ahsoka line. Went back, stayed in the line. The line is massively long. We are about a quarter, if that, of the way into the line, probably more like 10% into the line. And we get to the point where it's only about 15 minutes left of the signing, and we still haven't even got up there yet. There's still, like, probably three or four hours worth of people waiting behind us if it continues at this pace. And the lady comes out and first starts asking, you know, well, if you just want your book signed, let me know, but only by the author, not by everyone, and certainly not by Ms. Eggstein, and if you want to take me up on this offer, I can go get it signed for you, but you're not going to get to come up there. You'll just get the signed copy, but not get to meet the writer. Needless to say, pretty much everybody was like, F that. What the hell? Why are we standing in line if that's just, just piss off, lady? Um, at which point then, um, I guess one of the fire marshal security people came by and said, yeah, you can't have the line the way that this is. You've got to have some space, because the way that the Barnes & Noble booth was set up, there's a passage area that's like the main drag through the show floor. People need to be able to walk back and forth. Um, you can't have that blocked. So what they did basically was they got some more staff, again, all new people, not there the previous days, and separated out. So basically, if you were the first people in line, you're standing up in front of the booth, Then there's a gap for people to walk through, and then there's the actual line. And there were Barnes & Noble people at the end of either of those to sort of facilitate moving someone from one area to the next and move on to the next person in line. And because of the space needed, they were like, I can take the next one person, two person, three people, and they siphon off those peoples and people and send them through. As we're waiting and they start doing that process, they come back through and say, okay, okay, change of policy. Again, 
You're only going to be able to get one thing signed per person up there, because presumably they were going to have them sign it simultaneously to speed things along. So if you had brought the Ahsoka book, or bought the Ahsoka book, or the Ahsoka audio drama, or uh, uh, audio book, or anything like that, and you wanted something signed by both Johnston and Eckstein, screw you, you're out of luck. They'll only sign one item. And as with all the other things for the Barnes & Noble signing, it was one copy of something you've bought with us or the book or whatever, and one personal item maximum, so two per person. And if you had a party of multiple people with only two items, that really amounted to one person, not two people. Uh, just in case we got separated, I handed off my Ahsoka novel to my wife, and she had her Ahsoka shirt, the, the uh, I'm a Jedi Knight, or soon will be, older, her universe shirt that she wanted to get Ashley Eckstein to sign. Um... We're like, okay, well, I guess, you know, we'll have to have the author sign the book, and the next time I can sign the shirt if it's only one per. I don't know what the heck is going on with this. Um, but they finally call us up. We're one of the last pairs to be able to be called at all, or last people to be called at all. And as we're heading up there, they call one person. My wife steps forward, and she's got our stuff. And I turn to the guy, because there's plenty of room to walk beside the people who are up there waiting in line. Turn to the guy who's manning our side. That's my wife. I have nothing to sign. She's got it. Can I stand with her? No, you can't. No, you cannot. Okay, Nothing to sign. I'm not going to hold up the line. No, you can't walk up there and stand next to her. Bullshit. I'm like, yeah, all right, fine. I get it. They're being very strict with this, presumably because they got to be strict. Otherwise, it's going to become even more chaotic than it already is. I get it. Fine. I'll just wait over here for her. So I go to step out of the line to wait over there for her, kind of off to the side, and as I'm stepping out of line, Homeboy decides to block me. I say Homeboy, this scrawny white asshole, decides to block me from moving. This was the second time of the weekend up to that point where somebody almost got knocked out by either me or my wife, or got seriously injured by one or the other of us, because we don't play with that shit, putting your hands on people. Um, back in the line at the beginning, on that long line on the first day, the people who were yelling from behind us to the people who cut... Uh, a little bit in front of us, um, eventually, as he got to the doors, cut in front of those other people, almost got into a fight, and as they moved to do that, took my wife by the shoulders and scooted her out of the way. Had her hand not been still injured from her surgery, she probably would have laid them out, because I've seen her lay out people, uh, or, or, and, and heard stories of her boxing matches and such, where she had laid out people who were about six foot plus, and this guy was about my height, just more dickish than me, apparently. Uh, but she didn't, thankfully, so we were still able to get in. We weren't dealing with security all day. In this case, guy pull, does this shit um, and sort of pushes me back. I'm not trying to get up with her in the line. And he's giving me, I told you, you couldn't go stand with her. I'm trying to just move the fuck out of the way because I want to get away from this guy so I can be there when she gets done with the line. I get what he's saying. I'm not a moron. Um, thankfully, I explain that in about the same tone of voice I just used and moved around a different way to step away. And I gave him the glare that was basically, you know, please put your hands on me again and watch what happens. Um, had he grabbed me, like the guy had done to my, my wife, uh, said sister, my wife, and, uh, uh, and not just been trying to do like the arm bar thing, his arm probably would have been broken because my first instinct was this. Um, but again, stepped away, didn't complain. They've already got reamed enough by plenty of people screw it, went over to wait for my wife. Um, the guy behind us winds up in line behind my wife. He's raising hell already because I wasn't there with them. I didn't even know the guy, and he's raising hell on my behalf. Um, and my wife gets up there. She's able to get E.K. Johnson to sign the book, able to get Ashley Eckstein to sign the uh, the shirt. I had a chance to ask her the question about Gunji that she wanted to, and has a decent little conversation with Ashley Eckstein. And Eckstein's like, was that your husband? You know, who is this over here? Is that your husband? They wouldn't let him stay with you. And she's getting pissed off at the bullshit that Barnes & Noble is pulling on people. But see, that wasn't the worst of it, as you may have heard from my update, if you watch those a little on-the-fly updates, because they were doing that separation thing to everybody. If you have just two things to sign, or whatever, or three things to sign, if you count Mark Thompson, um, then that's one person. You can't have somebody stand with you, because I guess that takes up too much space. That takes up too much physical proximity, despite the fact that some of the people are being, you know, being pulled in, and other people are, like, gigantic. Whatever. One person. So they were separating out little kids with stuff to sign and letting them go through the line and telling their parents they could not accompany them. 
there was a kid who was like third, fourth grade or whatever, a little girl who was separated from her dad to go up and get something signed, who was almost in tears when she finally got to the desk to have Ashley Eckstein sign anything. And the dad was pissed, for his part, did not deck anybody, probably should have. Uh, I don't know that I would have had his restraint, even relative to the restraint that we had earlier. Um, and it, it, again, it was just it was, a, it was a screw. If something had happened to that kid while the kid was in that line, if if the crowd passing had blocked the view for a second and the kid had been snatched, then Disney, Lucasfilm, Barnes and Noble, Reed Pop are all on the hook for a massive lawsuit from which they maybe don't get out from under. Um, it was insane. All because they did not anticipate the crowd they were going to have for an Ashley Eckstein signing, which they probably should have. And they mismanaged it. And oh, by the way, with all that extra money that people were spending going off and going to Delray or Barnes & Noble to buy books. Um, one, there was a point at which the line to buy books was allowed to go and start getting stuff signed before the people in line for the signing. They put in, they nipped that in the bud real quick when people threatened to just about riot. Um, but also, they never did check and see any of the receipts. So it became a bait and switch. You're going to be thrown out of the line without a receipt, so you better go buy something. You go buy something, they never check the receipt. They have just basically conned you into spending more money on their product without any of the requirements that they claimed were the rationale for you doing so. Um, so not anticipating the size of the line, changing the way things were going to get signed, changing the requirements to get into the signing, separating people out, including parents from children, Barnes & Noble kind of took the cape even beyond Reed Pop on that first day's mess um, for mismanagement and logistical F-ups on the celebration floor. Um, so again, if there is a moral to the story, it's that again, these are crowded events, and the people in charge you would think would be able to manage them well because that's what they do to some extent, um, but not necessarily. Um, it really is kind of a crapshoot. It really is, in some respects, sort of an every man, every woman for themselves type of thing. Um, and those, to us, were the real black marks on the entire experience, waiting outside, the way they handled Thrawn, and the way they handled the Ahsoka signing. Other than that, we had a pretty good time. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next episode here of the vlog. So, from this case, logistic-wise, we've got our look at the convention as a whole and the process of going to it what to expect there, how to plan for it, how to hopefully budget for it or save some money, and where things went wrong to get all the negative out of the way, which leads us now hopefully to all positives as we get to looking at what exactly did Nathan and Jody do at Celebration Orlando, which will be our next vlog. I hope you don't mind the negativity. This just needed to all get out front so we could get it out of the way and keep that episode essentially pure about the experience and the fun and the energy of Celebration rather than being marred by these frustrations and screw-ups um, that unfortunately marred our experience, but hopefully in retrospect will fade over time so that we can think more about the positive stuff than still have those black marks on the, uh, uh, on the experience in reminiscence. With that, though, I'll wrap up this episode of the vlog. Thank you all for watching. Stay tuned for the next vlog with all that stuff about the positive experience of Celebration Orlando. It's coming soon.